Um, so I want to I want to cover three different things. I'm going to talk some about uh, philosophy, some about some examples, and then I'm going to make some assertions. Um, just by way of context, I'm one of the partners in a venture capital firm called Foundry Group. Uh, we're based in Boulder, Colorado, but we invest all around the country. And um, some of the investments that I'll talk about in the example section hopefully are ones, ones that you all have heard about. Um, I started off a long, long time ago as an entrepreneur, so my arc to becoming a venture capitalist was first as an entrepreneur, then as an angel investor, and now as, as a VC. And I've been investing since uh, the mid-90s, so there's been a lot of interesting stuff, good and bad, that I've been exposed to. Um, when I boil it down to the core philosophy that I have that informs the way I think about the investing that we do, uh, it came from a guy named Eric Von Hippel, uh, who was a doctoral advisor of mine when I was at MIT in the 1980s. And Eric made a profound statement in the 1970s sometime that I'll distill down to uh, essentially innovation comes from users. So in the 1970s, up to that point, the conventional wisdom was that innovation came from manufacturers and in, in, innovation came from industrial entities. And Eric essentially said, no, that's bullshit. Innovation comes from users. And he was an entrepreneur before he was a professor and he had a company that uh, built a very, very early fax machine you know, that was the size of this room probably. And he, he, they made the fax machine in such a way that it was hard to open it up. And his users, fax machine broke all the time, it was a shitty fax machine, <laughs> and his users would open it up and they'd tinker with it. And his company is like, nah, it's not good, we need to make it harder for people to open up the fax machine. So we're gonna like hermetically seal the fax machine. And you know, we'll send out a person to fix the fax machine. And the users figured out, well, the person didn't come fast enough, so they figured out how to open up the fax machine, fix the fax machine. And that was his insight that people actually want to solve their own problem with this stuff. And this is 1970s hardware software dynamic. And the when I look at the investments that I've made that are software related, hardware related, or other, they're all sort of on that underlying thread. Um, the second uh, piece of philosophy uh, from my frame of reference that, that drives it is, I think that, and I think Marcus did a spectacular job of sort of laying out, here's, here's an arc of an early stage financing dynamic. I think there's an enormous amount of mythology about how venture capital works. And there's this archetype of a venture capitalist as a thing. You know, whether it's it was Donald Duck that was hanging out with all the money or Daffy Duck or whoever it was, or I was at the Rosewood earlier today having lunch with somebody and everybody walked by in you know, like blue shirts and blue jackets and khaki pants. That's not actually, that's mythology, but separate sort of the dynamics around um, uh, VCs into different archetypes. And in my case, and again, I'm, I'll talk about my archetype and the specifics that I go after, um, as a firm, we have a set of themes that we invest in and those themes are ones that we know deeply. And if it's something outside of theme, we try to say no in 60 seconds. So we try to spend no time on anything outside these areas that we know extremely well. The area that overlaps with this universe is a theme we call human-computer interaction. So I operate under the premise, again, that everything comes from users and that the machines have already taken over. So my operating premise is that in the future, I don't know whether it'll be a, a human-enhanced computer future, computer-enhanced human future, doesn't matter. Their computers are just very patient. They're letting us put the data into them. And they're very frustrated when we're in a room like this that doesn't have 4G because we can't be putting data into them when we're in a room like this. It's very frustrating to the, the machines. So <laughs> our frame of reference as investors comes from that. And I've heard a couple people talk to me while I was here about, hey, it's cool that you're doing hardware investments and this sort of thing. We actually don't do hardware investments. We don't give a shit about hardware at all. What we love is we love software wrapped in plastic. <laughs> and if you look at how we think about this uni universe, we love products that people can make with their hands that don't require this sort of long arc industrial design process to get to a starting point. And it's one of the most amazing things that's happened that's come out of this sort of hardware innovation, open source hardware dynamic, whatever you want to call it, maker movement, that it has really shifted 
this sort of long arc in 2012 back to that philosophy that Eric started with in the 1970s, which is that users can create stuff that they care about. If you look at Kickstarter, it's absolutely phenomenal to see people that come up with an idea of a thing they want, and they can fund the development of the thing they want through other people who want that thing, and many of those things you can play around with. And oh, by the way, sure, there's lots of hardware and software in many of those things. Um, fundamentally, they're all linked together. So again, philosophically, we're thinking about things from a frame of reference. Again, one particular firm uh, within this construct of human-computer interaction uh, around the idea that software is the magic piece, but that software is often linked to hardware that the hardware can be relatively freely assembled. I already lost somebody. See, I chased him out. He's a hardware guy over there. I didn't care about software. <laughs> and I'm tongue-in-cheek when I say I don't care about hardware. Of course, I care about hardware. So let me give you a few examples, and, and I want to give you the examples of the funding arc of these companies so you see what that sort of plays out looking like. So first example uh, I'll do, uh, since, since Dale may, mentioned it, was MakerBot. So um, I, we invested in MakerBot nine months ago. Um, I had known about 3D printing for much longer than that. Um, probably uh, the first time I was exposed to 3D printing was a decade ago. Um, I was very interested in the Fab Lab and sort of this idea of being able to make stuff anywhere. And uh, I didn't really pay attention to uh, the, the sort of generational stuff that came out of RepRap and the 3D printing dynamic that we're seeing today. So I, hadn't, I sort of wasn't paying any attention to it, and all of a sudden I saw it. I got introduced to Brie uh, Pettis, and I got introduced to MakerBot, and before we actually talked, I went online and bought one. So this is lesson number one, is when you approach a VC, has that VC actually bought your product? If the VC asks you to send or give you their product, run because they don't get what you're doing. They don't care about the product. If they don't care about the product, do you really want them as your partner? I didn't buy a MakerBot gratuitously. I bought it because, or it's thingomatic, I bought it because I wanted it. <laughs> and it came, and my partner Jason and one of the guys that worked for us, Ross, spent a weekend, and we put it together, and we have a nice little picture of it with our signed on it and our blood on it. And by that point, we had essentially understood the dynamics around this product. And that was the interaction that developed with Brie and with the company over time. So thing number one, sort of in the example of the, of the curve is, does your potential investor engage with what you're doing versus ask you this long list of questions, but intellectually detached from what you're all about? Second example I'll give you is Fitbit. We're investors in Fitbit. Um, I passed on the first round of Fitbit. Uh, I passed on the first round of Fitbit because I became obsessed with this notion of human instrumentation. I believe that in 20 years we'll all be instrumented, all of our data at a cellular level will be instrumented and it will all be available in the cloud and there will still be HIPAA, so we won't, won't be able to share it with anybody, but we'll be able to do what we want with it. And if you're subversive, you can ignore the government and share your data anyway. Um, or we'll have it on a server in Iceland somewhere so we can share it that way. The uh, I intersected with Fitbit at the time that they had just released their first product because I was buying every product that looked like a Fitbit that I could find. There was a shitty Philips pedometer that was out, there was a thing called Body Bug that was out, and there were another, I have my closet full of uh, sensors that don't work uh, that I was trying to play with. And I hadn't really had enough bake time with the category. And there were all these things. So I saw the Fitbit and their first version was good, had some you know, glitches. But I wasn't like locked down on why, uh, why this was going to be the win. I also talked very publicly about it. I had a very short meeting with James Park, the CEO, 30-minute conference call or 30-minute phone call on the phone, so no interaction. And I came away from the call cold. So my fault, I was busy. I didn't engage with him as an individual in that, in sort of his fundraising journey. So I kind of said, look, I'm interested in the product. I'm going to play with it. And you know, maybe I'll cycle, I'll cycle back. About six months later, uh, his other two investors, uh, which were True Ventures and SoftTech, uh, John Callahan and uh, uh, Jeff Clavier, set, independently sent me notes saying, you have to invest in this company. It's perfect for you. 
And they, you know, had seen my blogging and seen what I'm talking about. I'm like, all right, I'll try again. I didn't really get along with, you know, I didn't really think that much of James. It wasn't that impressive, whatever. They're like, you're wrong. You're just totally wrong about James. He's unbelievable. And so this time I went and spent time with it. And I'd played with all the products, and the Fitbit was my favorite product. And I realized I'd completely made a bad judgment call on the person. In this case, James, because he's incredible. And his partner, Eric's incredible. So lesson number two is build a relationship with the people. If James had fought his way into a relationship with me at that point, I might have invested because that was probably the biggest part of it that caused me not to. But the second part was I just wasn't ready. And so by having a longer-term relationship with me, when it came back around, at least with his investors, it was possible. So even if an investor says maybe or not now or even no, you can still sort of deal with that dynamic. Um, last story I'll give you is uh, orbotics. And with orbotics, uh, this is a ball uh, controlled by a smartphone. And you may ask what's so interesting about that. And the answer, of course, is it's a ball controlled by your smartphone. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's so cool. The two guys that, that started it uh, went through Techstars, and they had three ideas. Idea number one was a remote control lock thing that you control with your smartphone. Number two was something stupid that you control with your smartphone. And number three was a ball that you control with your smartphone. I remember sitting down with them the first week of Techstars saying, Talk me through your ideas. And they talked me through the ideas. I said, well, which one do you want to do? Well, you know, the lock one, it's kind of interesting. Like, people think it's a great market, and the ball is really cool, but nobody thinks it's good market. Stop. Which one do you want to do? I said, really? I'm like, yes. I said, the ball, the ball is the most amazing thing ever. You could do so many things with it. So they went down this path, and again, dynamic of, of the path was they engaged with me and with a set of other people around this thing that they were incredibly excited about. And if you look at those three examples, all three of those examples are situations where there's hardware that was easy to assemble, was easy to figure out, was easy to prototype, generally used off-the-shelf components, but configured in ways that were quite complicated, and then surrounded by software that could be continually updated, continually improved, made better all the time, and in all cases was accessible to the users of the product in a really substantive way, whether you know, at the most uh, highest level APIs, but at the lowest level source code. So think about that in the context of the VC. Again, I'm giving you an archetype. I'm just trying to give you an example of one, not an example of what the horizontal venture community and world looks like. But understand that archetype before you start spending time with any of the individual VCs that you're gonna spend time with. So you know how to talk to them and relate to them and then build the relationship over time, even if they say no. I think Marcus said it really well. They'll help if they're interested, and if they're not interested, that's a good filtering mechanism. So if you're looking to raise money from venture, be patient, but match up as well as you can with people that are actually interested in the thing that you're doing. Thanks. <laughs>